Hallelujah. Shall we all pray? Father God, we thank you for this meeting. And we thank you for the lives of all who are watching us here and elsewhere, wherever they are, on the face of the earth. We give you all the honor. And Lord, we give you all the glory for this is what you have ordained for us, that we should walk in it. Lord, therefore, be with us tonight. Give us all teachable and understanding spirits. Grant us to behold wonderful things out of your word. Give us humility to receive and to practice. Lord, the thing that you teach us tonight, that we shall know how to walk worthy of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, let's say amen. Shall we all be seated? The works of the flesh. Tonight we're looking at the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh, and we take our scripture from Galatians to the five, Galatians five, sixteen to twenty-one. The works of the flesh. The title is the works of the flesh. And our scripture is Galatians chapter five, verses sixteen to twenty-one. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the thing that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, some Bible say witchcraft, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. We've been teaching or hearing teachings on the Holy Spirit, who he is, his importance, and how to receive his baptism, how to be filled with the baptism and uh, how to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So far, we've covered these um, areas. How to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Having received him, having been baptized with him, having been filled with him. But we look at one aspect of life that, that inhibits, that prevents uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit from being seen in our lives. In fact, uh, an aspect of life that, that makes it difficult for us to manifest the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, not to mention his gifts and his blessings. And uh, this the Bible calls the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. Now, as you have seen from the text that we have just read, the Bible says that we should walk in the Holy Spirit. Verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit. 
walk in the Holy Spirit, and we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The only way to, to, to avoid or to keep yourself from fulfilling the lust of the flesh is by walking in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the flesh lusts or fights against the Holy Spirit. The flesh, that is the self, the sin nature fights or lusts against the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit also fights against the flesh. And these are contrary, they are opposed to each other, to one another. To the extent that you do not do the things that you wish. Because of this, you come to a point where you really want to do some things to please God, but you find you are not able to do it. You just cannot do it. It is the Holy Spirit who helps us to subdue the lusts of the flesh. By ourselves, we are powerless. By ourselves, we are hopeless. In fact, hopelessly powerless. It is the Holy Spirit in us from God who helps us to subdue, to suppress, keep the lust of the flesh under so that we don't live according to the lust of the flesh. And this is what God, this is how God wants us Christian believers to live. It is only when we submit, and this is only possible when we submit to the Holy Spirit's power and control. Submitting to the Holy Spirit's power and control. First of all, knowing almost everything about the Holy Spirit. You must know a lot. If not everything, you must know enough about the Holy Spirit which you have been teaching and then to decide Make a conscious decision, a vow, a pledge, a promise to submit, to avail yourself to his power and control. And <laughs> walking in the Spirit, walking in the Holy Spirit means, therefore, living one's life under the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. This may all seem a bit bizarre or difficult to the person who has not really come to the point of experiencing this before. Uh, this may seem a bit um, strange. In fact, almost impossible to the person who has not experienced it before. If you have not tasted anything before, you will know how sweet or how bitter it is. Regardless of how it is described to you, it is only when you yourself experience it, when you, you, you taste it, then you know how it really is. Therefore, it is not surprising that this may seem a bit, a bit strange it's a bit bizarre, difficult to understand to those who have not experienced it. And that's because they have not actually made that decision. First of all, they didn't even know enough about the Holy Spirit. They didn't have no idea who he is, his importance and how to receive him, and what he can do in his or her life. Therefore, they are ignorant and this applies to many in the world, or all, almost all in the world, and as much as many in the church. We are told that the spirit and the flesh are opposed. They are contrary to one another. The Holy Spirit and the flesh are contrary to one another. In the life of the unbeliever, the one who has not accepted Jesus, the one who doesn't know the Holy Spirit, hasn't got the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit doesn't know him or her, uh, there's no opposition. 
the flesh is in control. The flesh is in absolute control. Maybe even from childhood or from adolescence, the, the flesh has been in control. And therefore, such a person doesn't know what it means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And he or she may assume that his or her life being controlled by the flesh is normal life. But tonight, this evening, wherever you are listening to the sound of my voice, hearing this teaching, let it be known to you that there's a difference between life lived under the flesh or under the control of the flesh, the self, the natural man, and life lived subject to the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Very big, huge difference between the two. Because the two are opposed to each other. They are contrary to each other. They are contrary to each other. And the word of God says, because they are contrary to each other, now, if you live under the power of the flesh, or if you are controlled by the flesh, you do not do the things that you wish to do. You may really wish to. You want to do some things to please God. Maybe you want to serve God. You want to go to church, but you cannot. You just cannot. You find it a bit, you know, no matter how much effort you put into it, you just cannot do it. Not to mention the unbelievers. This is the state of many so-called believers or Christians. They wish to do some things to please God, according to the word of God, but they just cannot do it. Therefore, they end up doing the things that they wish not to do. They won't end up doing the things that they wish not to do. And it's a very terrible state. Because when that happens, there is then a very, a very fierce, fierce and unstoppable conflict within that Christian. There's a very fierce a very, you know, um, <laughs> aggressive but unstoppable conflict war going on within that Christian. And they cannot be victorious by their own strength. They cannot win that fierce and unstoppable battle by their own strength except by the power of the Holy Spirit. It has not been given to you or to me to win that battle, that fierce contention, that fierce struggle by ourselves, except you have the power of the Holy Spirit within, within you working for you. Therefore, Jesus told the, the disciples that as you wait in the city of Jerusalem, they shouldn't go anywhere because that time, though they had heard all the teachings they have been with him. He has taught them. He had, they have seen the miracles. He had even given them power to cast out demons. He said, no, no, wait. Wait. Don't go anywhere. Don't try to do anything. Don't attempt to do anything. Until you are endued with power from on high. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall receive power from on high, from heaven. And then you can go out and you'll be able to Resist temptation, you'll be able to overcome, you'll be, be able to be victorious in this life, then you shall be witnesses to me. And the disciples waited until on the day of Pentecost in the upper room when the Holy Ghost came. That was the beginning of the earthly ministry of the Holy Spirit. When he came like with a sound like a, a rushing mighty wind. The whole place where they were sitting was shaking. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And since then, Christians in their millions continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And when that happens, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, you see that things of God come to you naturally and freely without struggle. There's therefore no conflict within you anymore. Now, Paul, Paul puts it very, very beautifully. Paul illustrates it very, very, very beautifully. Romans 7, 18 to 25. Romans chapter 7, verses 18 to 25. Romans chapter 7, beginning from verse 18 and ending at verse 25. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in his natural self, Paul is saying that, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in my natural self, nothing good dwells. There is nothing good. Nothing good can be found in my flesh. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. To will, to will to do good is present with him. But, shall I say but? We shall can say but. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not do, I will not to do, that I practice. Hmm. Verse 19 again. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Sin that dwells in the flesh. In other words, it is the flesh that is, that is, that is controlling, that is producing this. Verse 21. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Evil is present. As long as you are in this flesh, as long as you are a human being, Paul is saying, I find therefore that uh, evil is present with me, though I will to do good. So evil is not far. Verse 22. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. Yes. <laughs> Paul said that in fact he has great delight in the law of God. According to his, his inward man, his spiritual man, that is surrendered to God, you see, and that's the state of many Christians. Inwardly, they are surrendered to God. So according to the inward man, uh, they delight in the law of God. They like going to church. They are happy with the word of God. They feel good in the church. They like to sing gospels. They lift up their holy hands. They pray. You know, they delight. They actually enjoy the law of God. But at the same time, at the same time, next to all this in the flesh, there's another law. There's another, there's another thing working actively against this this. This desire, this delight in the law of God. There's something opposing it. There's something trying to pull it down. Something trying to, to wipe it out and replace it with the flesh. And that is the flesh. So, verse 22 says, For I delight in the law of God. According to the inward man, according to my spirit man, I like to do the will of God, the word of God. Hmm. But I see another law in my members. Verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring, opposing against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, which is in my flesh. Then for the I said, oh, wretched man that I am. It's a very wretched state, a very, very <laughs> terrible state. Oh, wretched man that I am. Fact, Paul is not talking about himself. Paul is talking about as believers. Oh, wretched man that I am, 
Who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will deliver me from this flesh? Who at all will deliver me from this body of death? Because he can see the flesh leading him to death, to hell. The spirits want to, to, to deliver him, redeem him, save him. But this conflict is going on. They said, I thank God, virtually, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself said the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he's saying that he's thanking God through Jesus Christ our Lord, because Jesus came to give, provide a solution to this problem. Jesus came, one of the things he came to do to destroy the works of the devil was to provide an answer, a solution out of this wretched situation for those who will worship in spirit and in truth. He says, I thank God. He said, I thank God. Why is he thanking God? Because now he sees a way out of that quandary, out of that dilemma, out of that difficulty. He sees a way, a way has been made out of that situation. So I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself said the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So, it depends on what you serve with. If you want to serve God with the flesh, you want to serve God with the flesh, then you will serve the law of sin. You are controlled by the law of sin. But if with the mind you serve God, you serve God, then you will be serving God in spirit and in truth. That's what Paul is saying. Now, therefore, how do you, how do you therefore get away, get away from this situation and serve the living God with your mind? How do you do it? You cannot do it. I cannot do it. And many Christians find themselves in this situation without knowing it. They can't do it, and they have they have surrendered. They have resigned themselves to it, and they call themselves Christians, but uh, maybe one day Christ will say, I never knew you. I never knew you. You thought I knew you, but I never knew you. You were never one of mine. You were never my disciple. You were never my child, my, my son or my daughter. I never knew you. So get away from me, you workers of iniquity. Because they have been serving, serving the flesh, they have been living in sin and iniquity because the law of the flesh is the law that has been working in their lives. Praise the Lord. Clap your hand for Jesus. The flesh produces dead works. The flesh produces dead works. The spirit produces life. The spirit produces life. The flesh produces, brings about dead works. That must be cleansed for the believer to be able to serve the living God. This must be erased, cancelled, before the believer will be able to serve the living God. Hebrews 9, verse 14. Hebrews 9, verse 14. Hebrews 9, verse 14. The Bible says here that how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, the Holy Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In other words, you need the Holy Spirit cleanse you, give you power over dead works to be able to serve the living God. As long as the, the flesh is living side by side with the spirit, that fierce contention, that fierce struggle is ongoing, ever present. No, but there are many Christians who go back and forth at one time, they are on, 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 they are, they are on fire for the Lord. 
on fire, but they have not allowed the flesh to be crucified. They have not allowed the flesh to be kept under. After a while, then they fall back to their fleshly state. Then they stop. You don't see them in church for a while. Then they surface after some time, again on fire. We welcome them. We are happy that they are here. After a while, they disappear again. And they keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There are others, and there were such Christians, when they realize that, no, what is going on is not good, then what they do is they join cold or lukewarm churches. Because in the hot church, their deeds are exposed. Their deeds are exposed. Because they've come to the light. In the hot church, they come to Jesus. They come to the Holy Spirit. So, they, so their deeds are exposed. And they are, they are not confident. But they love the darkness. Jesus said they love the darkness. They love some things in their lives. And therefore, they will go to or fraternize with the church where they can practice darkness and not feel guilty. Where the word of God is not preached in its totality, but, you know, it's preached, you know, um, selectively. And where, where no one is disciplined or cautioned, even if you are seen, the church knows, the leaders know that you are living in sin, they turn a blind eye and uh, they turn a deaf ear. The church that will turn a blind eye and turn a deaf ear, that church is blind and deaf. So if you are in a church that turns a blind eye and a deaf ear to what is going on, what they hear, they, don't, they, they pretend they have not heard because they, they, they delight in large congregations because they have delight in huge revenue and uh, they, they delight in being powerful, being opinion leaders. But when you have a, a pastor of a church with thousands, thousands, you become an opinion leader. Even the government begins to respect you. The government begins, if not fear, they begin to respect you because you, you control a huge section of the, of the population that the government begins to give you that honor, that respect, and that fear. Therefore, they don't want to lose these things. They don't want to lose the power, the, the money, the wealth, the fame. So they turn a blind eye and a deaf ear. And some people end up in these churches and they are very comfortable. And therefore, the numbers, the congregation in such church, churches keep swelling up, swelling up, swelling up. You have large, huge numbers. And people therefore feel that the more people you have in a the church, then the more powerful the church, the better or the best the church is. No sir, no madam. No sir, no. I, 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 I think otherwise. I believe on the contrary. But may God bless us all. May God bless you in particular. Clap your hands for Jesus. So, the Christian who is therefore led by the Holy Spirit, just know this, the Christian who is led by the Holy Spirit will do what is right naturally, will do what God wants. It comes naturally and freely. And not by compulsion, not by force. Not by compulsion. There's hardly any struggle going on. When it's Sunday morning, because they love God, they want the peace of God, they are, they are, they are anxious, they are, they are in a hurry to come to church. And as an illustration, you know, you think of the children, your little ones, children who have not reached the age of accountability. In fact, they are still in the age of innocence. Little children are what we call the age in the age of innocence. They are innocence. In fact, they don't they don't know the fifteen, they don't know evil or good. What parents what you tell them is what they do. So if the parents are good, they will do good. 
the parents are evil, they do evil. So they are in a, an age of innocence. Now, you agree with me that these children, when it's time, Sunday morning, or come to church, they actually enjoy it. They enjoy it. They are very, very excited. They, 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 they are happy to, oh, you are going to church, oh, you are going to church, they are very happy. And when the parents don't come for two, three weeks, they will remind the parents, why haven't we been in church for three weeks? Because in their members, in their flesh, the law of the flesh is not there. And because from the womb, the time of the womb, they've been hearing message in the church, that's all they know. That's all they know. Therefore, Jesus said, that anyone who causes any of these little ones to sin, oh, shall be judged. Anyone who causes any one little thing to sin shall be judged seriously. Amen. Children, to children, this comes naturally and freely. It becomes part of their lifestyle. Because they are not under bondage to any acts of unrighteousness. But you and I, the moment you reach the age of accountability. When now we know the difference, then we need the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us. Therefore, Paul says, the works of the flesh are evident. They are clear. They can all be seen. They are evident. They can be seen. The same way as the fruit of the Spirit can be seen, the works of the flesh are evident. It's not something you can hide. They are obvious, clearly seen. Then he goes on to make a list of these um, things, these works. Verse um, 20, uh, 19. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. They are evident, can be seen. Video, video, some, video, something that can be seen. Evident comes for the word video, it can be seen. And therefore, you cannot say, I, I, I didn't know it. I was not aware. It's obvious. Those practicing, practicing it know it. And those who see it, see it. Those who hear it, hear it. They are evident. <laughs> and then he says, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. These works have been grouped. They come into four groups. The first group, to make it easier for you and for me to understand, you can see that the, the Bible, God has grouped them. The, God has not mixed them up. The first four are sexual sins. And sexual sins are, in fact, <laughs> there are many. There are many are, they, are those who are being controlled by sexual sins. Adultery. You cannot bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit we feel the Holy Spirit, if you are married, you have an extramarital affair, extramarital affair, sex, that is adultery. It's very common. Men of God, church leaders, church members, many of them are in this, in this um, work. In this, uh, it's work. It's work that you do. Many are engaged in this work. Fornication. Fornication is illicit, ungodly, sexual practice out of marriage. That's fornication. You're not married to the man, you're not married to the woman, and yet you sleep together. That is fornication. Now, uncleanness and lewdness. Uncleanness, it took me a long time to actually understand the difference between uncleanness and lewdness. Now, I'm sure many of you don't even know the difference. <laughs> if you should have a quiz and put 5,000 CDs. Between, I don't think there's anybody here who can, who can collect that money. But uncleanness is anything that is considered bad, immoral, and an impure sexual behavior. So these are, don't forget, these are sexual sins. So uncleanness refers to bad what society, what a normal society would consider to be bad. Immoral. 
impure sexual behavior. And here we can, we can put here lesbianism, homosexuality, bisexual, transgender, queer, LGBTQ, plus, 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 plus. The plus means that goes on forever. You can add yourself to it. So these are uncleanness. These are unclean, bad, immoral, impure, sexual. You cannot tell me that lesbianism is pure. Homosexuality is pure. It's bad. It's immoral. It's impure. Bisexual, tr transgender, queer. After the queer, anything can fit there. Queer. Put anything, anything that is not normal is queer. That's uncleanness. Lewdness. Lewdness is what is defined as rude and offensive sexual behavior. Rude. Rude. Offensive sexual behavior. And you see this on television. And when you go to, if you care to go to some places, nightclubs, sensuality, sensuality. The way people walk, they walk, especially the ladies, they walk so as to attract every man passing by will turn. Without, without wanting to know how he's turning. They won't turn immediately. They'll go for some, they walk and then they turn quietly and look at it. But they want to see how the woman or the lady is walking. The, walking, the lady is walking like, you know, catwalk. Swinging their hips and, you know, walking such a way to attract. Being sensual. Lewd dancing, what we call sexual dancing. And these days we even see that in churches. Sexual dancing has been introduced in churches. Lewd dancing. Dancing in such a way that, you know, all the men can't go to sleep. They, are, they, are all, they sleep on the wedding beam, but as soon as they're sexual, they all wake up. Sexual dancing or lewd dancing. Immoral dressing. Dressing that is immoral. You, you know them. What do you call it? Uh, this, this, this is not mini skirt, but it's what? It is super mini skirt. Super mini skirt. And I remember when I some of you know, when I was transferred to Tema, Tema, or in chapter one, the, the announcer, then the announcer, when I, I was shocked, you see that the announcer who announces the, uh, give the announcement every day had a, a skirt, a skirt that is, what do you call it? With a, 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 it, it is it's a slit here, you know, the gap here, all the way to the hip here. You are not there, so you have to believe me. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm, who I'm talking about. And you, you used to sit at the back and walk through all the way to the front with a... Uh, and I said, what is this? What is this? So dressing, um, immoral dressing, exposing bare back, bare front, bare sides, Bare, bare, can I say bare bottoms? Do you have that now? You don't have bare, bare bottoms? You don't have that? Indecent dressing. The indecent conduct. Your conduct is indecent. There's something called lasciviousness. Feeling or showing sexual desire. See, sexual desire can be infective. The person that will roll the eye and look at you in a very sexy manner. That is lasciviousness. Oh, you are saying, hey, it's happening in churches. Roll the eye and look at you in a very sexy manner and talk to you in the... And if you're not careful, you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be infected. That is what we call lasciviousness. You know, sensual feeling and sensual desire. Debauchery, debauchery is immoral behavior that involves sex, drugs, and alcohol. In fact, in fact, lewdness, lewdness is, 
is wanton, careless display of sensuality that knows no shame. In other words, there's no shame. The person is like a dog. The person has been reduced to the, the level of a dog. Dogs, they, they copulate. You see broad daylight, you see two dogs doing their own thing. No shame. That's what the person has come to. And it's happening. It's happening. It Maybe not here in Ghana, but if you go elsewhere in the, in, 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 in the, in, in the so-called Western and the, uh, enlightened world, some things that you see, I remember when we were many years ago, maybe not now, many years ago when I lived in, uh, in, in Ireland, in Ireland, Dublin, there was a case where a boyfriend and girlfriend were having sex in broad daylight in the garden, a park, a park where people go to just walk around. They were having sex there. And because then we are supposed to mind your business. <laughs> you can't talk anybody's business. Everybody was walking by and they were doing their own thing. In broad daylight, in a park. In a park. That is debauchery. And many years ago, I had a, a, a friend who, it wasn't a friend, actually he came to, he came from America, Ghanaian living in America. And he brought America with him. And he came, and I had to meet him, and uh, I went out with him one day, and uh, he had a girlfriend in Ghana, and the way he would be holding the girl, and you know, so uh, we met somebody, and I, I felt very uncomfortable. Then we met someone, he said, hey, I did end a devil, I'm going to team. The first thing was bold enough. A man said, hey, what you are doing is something we do in the privacy of our bedrooms. And you are doing this so openly at Makola Square, Rollins Park. You are doing this. And there in a demon, and I'm wearing a bontin, say. Lord, this may all sound strange to you, but one day you may find yourself elsewhere, out of this country, and then you come across these things where they are practiced normally. And if you don't know these things, you may think, oh, there's nothing wrong. But having heard today's word, Michelle come. Tema, Tessia, Niboita, and our brethren in the diaspora, and whoever you are, having heard today's teaching, let it be known to you that this is uncleanness and this is lewdness. Lewdness. Check, clap your hands for Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, the next nine, the next nine, sorry, the next two. Uh, sins connected with pagan religion. Idolatry, idol, idol worshipping, and sorcery. Sorcery means consulting. It's magic. Consulting mediums, going to juju to get for your business, to get power for your business, get power for this, and all that. That is, that is sorcery. Sorcery. And I know, I told you before that I had a, a friend who was in the Church of Pentecost, Pentecost of years ago, maybe not now. And his father, his father was a sorcerer. And his father specialized. His father specialized in making, giving men power to chase girls. So you come to him, you do something for you, any girl you propose, the girl will not follow you. That's what, the, what, that's what the father was doing. Until this, my friend, moved into the house. He moved into the father's house and he used to pray a quiet time. The man, this my friend, moved into his father's house. Now the man will come and get the, medi the, the, the medicine or juju. Medicine, over here, Drew. Medicine, whatever it is. But not para. And then the thing wasn't working. The juju stopped working. So the father was wondering why, why how can that this sorcery that have been passing and bringing him money? Because you know, the man will come and say, oh, now the thing I went didn't work. Then he realized that it was his son, the believer, who had just moved into it. He had his own room. The fact that this son was in the room, in the house with him, the juju wasn't working anymore. So the father then had to sack his son, drive him out of the house, in order to make the juju work. May God have mercy. May God have mercy. 
And of course, if, if you are a Christian and have the Holy Ghost in you, and such a man invites you, it will not work. And may it never work. May it never, never work. In the name of Jesus. So, sins connected with pagan worship, idolatry, and sorcery. Then the next nine, nine of them are sins of temper. Sins of temper. Nine are sins of temper. Think of it. Nine are sins of temper. And here we look at hatred. Hatred. Or time. Or time. Contentions. Contentions. Fighting. Fighting. You get angry and then you fight. You shout. Your neighborhood, they know you as you. Hey, Obetu, you cry when you come out. You come Jealousies. Outbursts of wrath. Outbursts of anger. Selfish ambitions. You are ambitious, but your ambition is that for you, 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 you. Selfish ambitions. Dissensions or discord. Anywhere you go, you create confusion. You don't, you don't like people to be happy. You just divide people. Destroying marriages, destroying churches, destroying friendship, dissensions, heresies. Heresies is not believing the real word of God. You have your own belief, doctrine. Envy, murders. Murders here includes uh, abortion. Murder includes abortion. So these are sins of temper. Sins of temper. Coma. And you can see there are nine of them. And then finally, the last two, the last two, um, drunkenness and reveries. And the Bible says, and the like. Now, there may be others. Drunkenness. Don't tell me that you can drink and not get drunk. Then why are you drinking? What are you drinking for? Praise the Lord. Appetition here there. And here there. Appetition. Vodka. Beer. And here there. But, so you only drink it to get drunk. You only drink because you want to get drunk. And that's it. Drunkenness. Drunkenness. Otherwise, why would you spend your money? I don't know how much a bottle of beer is now, but I, I, I'm sure it's about 10 CDs. Your hard earned money just to drink. You know, it's not nice. When's that now? A pan time. A cow. A pan time. Many, many years ago, when I, when I used to drink, I know, say, I don't know what that's actually, I, I believe it's it. Guinness, isn't it bitter? You haven't done, I don't know. I know. You can't tell me whether yes or no, because you haven't drank Guinness for a long time. But it's very bitter. So you only drink to get drunk. That's the only reason why you drink. So don't tell me that you drink not to get drunk. Not to get drink. You, you, get, you drink to get drunk. Reveries are wild parties. Wild parties where worldly music is being played loud. People are dancing, hey, hey, hey. Holding beer, holding, vodka, holding uh, whiskey, dancing. You know, everybody's drunk, hey, hey, hey. Even degenerating in what we call orgies. You know, in some places they have they have um, what they call orgies where the thing begins as a party, normal party, then it, it degenerates into a reverie, reverie, and orgy where now we just pick a partner and begin to do our own thing. You need to know this so that one day we find ourselves in places where these things are practiced, practice, you know that they are wrong. And you not join them. Not join them. I, 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 I had a classmate, a school, he was actually one year behind me. Um, who traveled to America. When he was in Ghana, he, he appeared to be a Christian with his wife and children. Said, well, look, look at a decent family. They went to America. And after, when he got to America, he got swept away by the American way of life. And his wife here he heard that he was taking part in reveries and orgies and those kind of things. So the wife became concerned and was able to contact him. Now then, 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 yo, what has happened to you? What am I hearing? 
Then the husband said, oh, ah, so America is a normal way of life. <laughs> what, what I'm doing is normal. That's what everybody does. It is not normal. No, there are Christians, many Christians. Most of the Bible literature, most of the Bibles are printed in America. Nelson, John Devan, they publish it in America. Many, almost all the theological Bible schools, good ones, they are in America. America is a land of extremes. Good Bible schools, America. Excellent Christians, America. So I call America the land that is flowing with milk and honey. America is a land flowing with milk and honey. So is Europe. But, as the reporter said, it's also a land that devours its inhabitants. So you should, you, should, you should find yourself there one day. Be careful you don't get devoured by the sons of the Anakim. They are there. The Anakim are there. They are all there. Christians are there. And the believers, the pastors, they are highly anointed. You know of Benihin and others. Benihin, you know them. They are highly anointed. But at the same time, all the drugs, drugs, drug cartels and drug sniffing, they are all there. They sniff, put that thing on them, inject. They are all there. So it's a land. If it's your ambition to go to America, know that I'm saying, I'm telling you today that America is a good place. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. But the sons of Anak, the Anakim, they are there. And it's a land that also devours its inhabitants. Praise the Lord. Clap of two hands for Jesus. Reveries. Reveries. Then Paul sounds a warning here. He says, those who practice our things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice our things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Before we go on to talk, come back to the Holy Spirit and what he does for us, it's good to know this, that these things work against the work of the Holy Spirit. They, they oppose his fruit, they oppose his presence, and there's a fierce struggle going on. But it shouldn't be so. Once you have filled the Holy Spirit, it should come to you naturally. Come to you naturally and freely. Without compulsion, you don't have to force you to come to church. You don't have to force you to come for a prayer meeting. You don't have to, you don't have to hold a program. Ghanaians like programs. Programs. I don't know what programs. I don't know what you see in programs. Programs. Because you, are, you all want to be programmed. When you see a program with a, a poster, poster of some pastor dressed in a very expensive costume, smiling invitingly, everybody's going there. But for such meetings where we are teaching the word of God, People find it a bit mundane, a bit too common. But if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you enjoy it. And you want to hear it. You want to have it. May you all enjoy it and may you have it. That's what will pave the way for the next teaching that is going to come. We're going to look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts. Of the, and that gift is for all of us. It's not only for some. It's for all of us. The reason that very few get these gifts, even pastors, very few pastors get these gifts is because they have not actually allowed the Holy Spirit to manifest fully in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we on our feet?